Thanks so much, Dan. And good evening, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with all of you and this wonderful set of panelists for our first By Degrees Climate Summit. Um, you know, as a climate change reporter, I spend a lot of time writing about problems and challenges and about the things that New Hampshire and New England are losing as our climate changes. And I think that loss and the feelings that come with it, like grief and frustration, are really important to talk about. But we all know the saying that every crisis is an opportunity. And tonight, we're going to focus on the many opportunities that we have to take transformative action in the face of the climate crisis. And we're going to talk about solutions that can improve not only the climate, but also our lives, the way we eat, how we get around, the jobs we can have, the way we get our energy, and so much more. A few reminders before we get started. This event is being live streamed, so welcome to our virtual audience as well. Thanks um, so much for joining us today. Um, and for those of you who are here in our audience, I need to remind you to please silence your phones, um, but don't put them away. You can go to nhpr.org slash climate, um, and there's a link with a form to share thoughts and questions with our panelists. So we'll encourage you to send those questions in, um, and we'll incorporate some of those into our panel tonight. Um, that's nhpr.org slash climate, and you can find a link there to submit your questions for the panelists. Um, and then on that form to share your questions, we'll also be asking you a few questions. So there's some things to be thinking about as we move into this panel. Um, the questions we'll ask you are, what's a tangible climate solution that you're excited about and why? And then also, how do you feel when you think about climate solutions? So without further ado, we're so excited to have this panel of New England leaders on climate solutions with us today. Um, I get to introduce your panelists now. <laughs> Doria, I'll start with you. Doria Brown is the first ever energy manager for the city of Nashua. She specializes in energy portfolio management, renewable energy project management, and greenhouse gas accounting. And she's also a skilled climate communicator making short form video content on her Earth Stewardess platform online. So give it up for Doria. <laughs> Next, we have Aziz Dekan. He's the executive director of the, climate, the Connecticut Roundtable on Climate and Jobs, which builds alliances among diverse constituencies to combat climate change, create jobs, and promote racial, economic, and environmental justice. Aziz. And then we also have Haley Jones. Um, Haley's the Vermont and New Hampshire State Director at Slingshot, which works alongside community groups to take aim at polluters and build community power. They also serve on the Board of Migrant Justice, coordinate a bilingual culinary collective, and volunteer as a medical interpreter. So give it up for Haley. <laughs> and let's get started. So Doria, I'd like to start this off with a question for you. Often when we think about climate change, we're thinking about stopping something, you know, ending the burning of fossil fuels, keeping global temperature rise up under one and a half degrees Celsius, preserving our lifestyles in the process. But flipping that around, what are you trying to start or create as you respond to climate change? So as we respond to climate change, I think we're really creating a new type of technology that already exists. Um, climate change, as you said, is a great opportunity to take what we already have, like vehicles, electricity, um, heat in our homes, and change it to something that is more efficient and more related to our everyday lives. So I think that it's just a great opportunity to remaster technology and create something that's new but old. Mm -hmm. I want to extend this question to the rest of the panel, too. So Aziz, could you talk a little bit about what, what the things that you're trying to start you know, in the face of climate change? Well, I think part of the, the opportunities that we have, and I, I, I am going to resist and call it climate crisis, because I think that's really where we're at right now. Um, we're at a tipping point. So if we can take that tipping point and create jobs with it, create good union trade wage jobs, sustainable jobs, um, I think that's, that's the path that uh, the climate crisis can actually lead us to. Um, it's not just about a just transition from fossil fuels to renewables. It's about creating jobs for people who have been left out of the job market to find out, to make sure that the people in marginalized communities who have not had access to these jobs have access. And in particular, to make sure that um, we get rid of fossil fuels uh, plants and, and whatever else are in those marginalized communities, because that's where they've always been placed. Mm -hmm. Haley, I, I want to extend also to you the opportunity to respond. Yeah, thank you, Mara. 
I think for us at Slingshot, since we're a group of community organizers, uh, the climate crisis, climate change, climate chaos, is a really good opportunity for working with folks, folks who are most impacted by these problems, whether that's a coal plant you know, next, to, next to your home, or whether there's a fracked gas pipeline uh, going, going through your town. Um, the climate crisis is really, really politicizing a lot of folks who maybe have not been centered before in the white-dominated mainstream environmental movement. And so even though we're dealing with so many challenging, heartbreaking, heartbreaking situations, it is a time when people can be getting together, making connections, building up their skills, and really fighting for change based on their own lived experience of, of the climate crisis. Thanks so much, Haley. Aziz, I know in your in your response you mentioned just transition. Um, we hear about you know the, the phrase just transition often as a way to you know that climate action can better our lives. But could you talk a little bit about what a just transition means, how you define it, and how you see that show up in your work? Yeah, sometimes I'm not sure I even know what a just transition is. To be honest with you, I mean it, the, the simplest is that um, we we move from fossil fuels to renewables, and as I said before create jobs through that, um, that's a just transition. If you don't, especially for the, we work, the, the round table works with unions and trades, and if we don't involve them, if we don't show them that there's a path from them leaving these fossil fuel jobs into renewables, we're done. I mean, let's just be honest about that. Um, the trades and unions have a lot of power, and that power can move towards renewables. So. I see a just transition as just that. It's, it's a way to make sure that lost jobs in the fossil fuel uh, sector are found and increased in the renewables. And the, you know, I'm older and I keep hearing this, uh, I have to watch my language, the BS that I keep hearing about, oh, there's no jobs, there's no future in renewables is not true. I mean, there, you look at look at wind turbines, look at solar farms, look at all the things that you know, building EV vehicles. It's it's a huge growing sector, and we need to take advantage of that. That's what a just transition looks like. Mm -hmm. And how are you seeing that show up in your work? I can also extend this to other panelists. Like, are you seeing moments of that already happening? Yes and no. So yes, that uh, in Connecticut we passed a bill that that uh, puts trade uh, standards, building standards on large renewable projects, two megawatts or greater. Um, but the problem in there is that we see developers coming in with projects that are one megawatt, two, two one megawatt projects. So they skirt the law, they skirt the rules. And how do we stop that? So that's an issue as well. Um, what was the, I'm sorry, where were we? <laughs> how, do you see, how do you see the just transition yeah. either playing out or not yet? So, in your and, and just another piece that, I, that we've been hearing a lot more about is that, so the fossil fuel industry has been around for you know, 100 years, whatever it is, hundreds of years. And they know how, they know, the people who work in that industry know how that industry works. The people who are starting work in the renewables, the offshore wind people, the, the solar panel, large solar panel people, even the home uh, 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 installers, they're making their own rules as they go along most of the time. I mean, there are government rules and whatever, but they make their own rules and it makes it really difficult for people to understand what are those rules. So there, there's, there's chaos, <laughs> there's climate chaos in that. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's, an, uh, there's a level of uncertainty that we need to fix. Doria and Haley, do you, do you want to also yeah. talk about how you're seeing that play out in your work? So I think that's a really interesting question because there are consequences for climate action if we move too slowly. Um, so let's say there isn't enough climate action and resources become extremely limited and only the very wealthy are able to have access to those resources. Um, and then people who are living in poverty are left behind. But then you have this issue where if we move too quickly, we're gonna leave people in poverty behind. So I think it's important that as we transition, a just transition looks like bringing everybody along with it. And I think a really interesting example of that is Nashua's Community Power Program. So we started a program that um, allows us to purchase energy on behalf of the community at um, 
a lower rate than the utility right now. We're saving people, I think, four cents per kilowatt hour. That's $27 on their bill. But also in this program, it's connecting people to more renewable energy options. It's building reserve funds so that we can invest in the community and that everybody can have access to that energy. It's gonna take a little bit longer to build those community renewable energy projects, but it's a way to bring everybody along with it and have a just transition. Mm -hmm. And do you see that that as sort of scalable? Like when you think about New Hampshire and New England in general, I know New Hampshire, uh, Massachusetts and Rhode Island allow community power, but New Hampshire is sort of the third New England state on this wave. Do you see that as scaling up in the state or in the region? Absolutely. I know that New Hampshire is a little bit behind on the wave, but since we're behind on the wave, we've gotten to learn a lot from Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and more specifically California. And I honestly think that we have a way more advanced and robust program here in the state that's going to bring more opportunity for that just transition. Mm -hmm. Haley, I want to turn to you. I want to ask um, a little bit about the values that you think about when you're thinking about climate action um, and your work on climate solutions. So how do you and the communities that you're working with sort of decide if something that's good for the climate is also good for the community? And how do you, how do you have those conversations? That's a great question. And as a fairly new organization, that's something we think about uh, every hour of every day including non-work time. Um, and I think our biggest, our biggest guiding principle is tr truly guide, don't decide. So we are like vampires. We want to be invited into a community. Uh, we don't want to go rampaging around saying, oh, I'm an organizer. I've got this training. Therefore, I know what is best for you when I might not live in a town where, where I'm working with folks. So first of all, we want to get that call from people. Uh, we want to make ourselves known. We want to make ourselves trusted. We want people to give us as references. Um, oh, no. That was you. OK. <laughs> um, and then when we've gotten that first call, we say to folks, OK, what's going on? What are you dealing with? What's the problem? And also, what do you want to see happen? And then we'll go out and we'll meet people in community centers, in the synagogue, in the library. I've sat in a lot of, of older folks' kitchens, you know, just chit-chatting. And once again, I am never going to say, I've done all this research and I've decided what will work for you. It's about us working together. And often, you know, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a policymaker. and kind of take off some of the load from my office um, to teach people about it. So I find that to be very effective, to, to kind of build a small coalition 
of community members who are excited about something and then let them out like a virus. I know it might be too soon to say that, <laughs> to spread it around the community. Yeah. Um, so this can go to Aziz um, or Doria or Haley, any of you can take it. Um, but there's a lot of federal funding for climate solutions right now, most recently with the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, what do you wish more people understood about how their communities can benefit from this funding? I think it can feel sort of far away. Um, and, and what do you see as sort of opportunities and, and pitfalls there? You go first. I can uh, cold call you as these to go first. So the IRA, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, which has an awful name to it, but the IRA, um, it's a once in a generation type of, of legislation. It puts standards on renewables. It creates new renewables. It, it, it puts money into states that haven't had this kind of money. Um, you know, I, I don't think we've seen anything quite like this since Lyndon Johnson's Great Society uh, uh, work. Um, and part of the problem, we've talked about this earlier, is that we don't, we don't hear enough from the Biden administration about what this is doing for the economy and what this is doing for the environment. And we need to take that narrative and, and throw it out there and make sure people understand. This is truly, I'll say it a second time so you all hear it, it's a once in a generation type money and you're not gonna see it come back. And so every state needs to take advantage of it um, and you know there are multiple layers, not just for um, not just for companies, not just for individual, well, for companies and individuals. I mean that that there's money for everybody, and take advantage of it. Go on this on site. I'm putting new windows in. I'm getting rebates on my windows. <laughs> I would never have gotten that before. Yeah, Doria, how are you seeing that play out in Nashua? Um, one thing I, I hate to take it to the negative side, but one thing that I'm a little <laughs> bit concerned about is whether we'll have access to these funds in New Hampshire. So some of the funds are delegated through the state and some are delegated directly to communities. So I'm interested to see how the state delegates those funds if we get enough access to them to really make an impact. Um, another thing I'm interested in is how communities are going to take advantage of some of these tax rebates that they said are now available to communities, but we don't file tax returns. So how are we going to access it? So that's something I'm on the edge of my seat for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question on that? So when ARPA money came, wasn't that the same issue, the transparency of how you use that money? So I didn't really deal directly with ARPA funds. Okay. So I don't know if I can answer that question in a way that's gonna fulfill right now, but I do know the people in Nashua who did, so I can probably get you their contact to be able to Because yeah, we heard to. that problem in Connecticut frequently, the, the lack of transparency of, of how that money was getting to the, to the people who needed it the most. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Haley, you know, what's your perspective on this, this influx of federal funding around climate solutions and, and how you see that connecting with folks you're working with? I've not done a ton of work on influxes of federal funding. Um, but I can say, knowing from some work that Slingshot has done with groups around PFAS remediation, which I recognize is adjacent to its environmental, environmental injustice, right, PFAS contamination, um, a real challenge there has been that even though there is significant federal funding available, and this is echoing exactly what you said, Doria, even though there's this federal funding, the state's got some real chunks of money, community, there I go again, Folks in town, folks in town <laughs> aren't necessarily sure how to access these rebates. And we're talking $5,000, you know, to get a point of view system installed on your house, to get yourself off bottled water. Um, and, you know, these aren't perfect solutions, but people at least need to be able to access them. And so, you know, from my perspective, that can look like if it's grant writing, get grant writers out in the community. Um, if it's a tech issue, like set up a, you know, set up a Wi-Fi hotspot and have like a tech come and support people. Or like I worked with a group in Londonderry and we held office hours with the Department of Environmental Services to walk people through, uh, especially seniors in town, walk people through the process for getting these rebates. So I know it seems loosely connected, but access, 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 if the money's gotta be there, especially in a state like New Hampshire, there's gotta be a way for folks to, for folks to get to it. Yeah. Um, 
I've just got a question from the audience. So Zaina in the audience asks, how do we make sure that available federal funding and state funding is inclusive? How do we include small businesses, minority-owned businesses, renters, et cetera? How do we lower the access bar or the bureaucratic hurdle? Doria, do you want to take that first? That's three questions. If I could answer that question. <laughs> that three if, if I could answer that precisely and with, um, yeah, I would be, be paid a lot more <laughs> than I am now. And um, you get status as genius. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I wish I had the answer to that question. As somebody on the community on the city side, I think the best way to do that is through city or community organizing and implementing projects such as like community car charging, community renewable energy. I think that resources that everybody has access to and everybody in the community owns is a great way to leverage those barriers to make sure that that funding is accessible. Okay, got it. Aziz, do you want to weigh in? Oh, Haley, Haley's raising their hand. Haley, you want to weigh in? I'm so excited we'll about this one. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, well, negative first and then positive. Um, language justice and language access is like my favorite thing in the whole wide world. And you know, we saw this, I, I, I live in Vermont and did a lot of work in Vermont back in 2020 and 20, 2021 on the like inaugural environmental justice legislation. And so we, you know, we compensated folks from most impacted communities and had a bun bunch of conversations with people and asked, what do you want to see from the state? And so many people said, it's great that you had resources about COVID or X environmental health problem or the PFAS down in North Bennington. I'm an English language learner. I don't know what the heck you were saying. And so I think having language access, even in a state where there are a lot of English speakers like New Hampshire, I think that's a huge part of any sort of climate communication or learning or organizing that you want to do. Have your interpreters, pay your translators, make sure that you've got materials up on sites that people actually use. If people don't trust government websites, no one's going to read it. Put it on Facebook, put it on WhatsApp, and get creative with your organizing, because it's not just for organizers, it's for government, too. I have a question. So going deeper into social media, what do you think the role that sites like Instagram and TikTok play with these things outside of Facebook and WhatsApp? What do you think of that, like shorter form content in order to communicate? Yeah, that's a great question. And I actually want to ask you about that as well. Are you Una reversing me? <laughs> well, I'll answer first. It feels polite. <laughs> I will say that a lot of the groups that I've worked with, particularly in the North Country of New Hampshire, we're mostly working off of landlines. You know, some folks have cell phones but don't trust them or there's no cell service and don't even talk about Facebook, right? People are like, we don't trust that. And so I, as an organizer in, in the north of these two states, have not had a lot of opportunity to play around with these, these shorter form social medias. And it's something I'm really interested in, and I would love to hear your thoughts. <laughs> so I recently had a discussion with somebody who has a larger following or more friends on Facebook, whereas I have more following on Instagram. And I think location-wise, organizing on Facebook will get you closer to people who actually live in your community Whereas on Instagram and TikTok, you might have more of a national audience and be able to make more of a, a national like, hey, this is how you might organize something in your community type impact where on Facebook you can say, hey, this is what's going on in the community. Do you want to learn more? Here's the event. So I think that it's really interesting that you have people who absolutely aren't on Facebook, no cell phone, and are on a landline because that's something that is completely foreign to me. So I find that fascinating. I want to ask, um, I'm seeing that we're getting a few questions from the audience about resistance and how to handle that. So Dan in our audience says, I'm all for community engagement in the clean energy transition. I'm also mindful that communities often object to changes they can see. NIMBYism is real. So NIMBYism, for those who don't know, not in my backyard. Um, 
how to balance community voice and the urgent need to accelerate the transition with new energy infrastructure situated in communities. So, Dory, this is like what you were talking about earlier with the, you know, the timing of the energy transition. If we go too slow, we miss people. If we go too fast, we miss people. So, um, yeah, how do, you, how do you respond to Dan? So, the way I would respond to that is with my community power program. I think it's just such a great example. Um, with that program, it got people to talk more about energy. And it's expanded the conversation to talk more about energy infrastructure, and now talk more about renewable energy. And with this thing that has given people savings and decreased energy rates, now it's something positive that is leading them down a path to increase energy infrastructure, to increase renewable energy. And I do have to say one very surprising part about organizing that program was the feedback. I expected to get a lot of people being very upset about a community power programs, um, saying, oh, Nashua is overreaching, or um, I don't want you touching our energy rates. But it's actually been quite different. It's been people being like, wow, I'm so excited that my energy rate is lower. Tell me more about what you're doing. So I think that once you have that breakthrough program that gets people excited, that really shows the benefit from energy savings and financial savings, now you have kind of like this, uh, I want to say, uh, fire that's catching on across all of these energy platforms and opportunities. So it sounds like it's really about communicating how the co-benefits are going to show up in people's lives. Absolutely. And if you can get that one program where it's like an aha moment, it'll keep going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Aziz, I want to ask you about this too. How do you respond to, to folks who resist? So I think one of the keys to that is community benefits. Um, that every, when you put a, when you do start doing renewables, um, fossil fuels never did community benefits. So if you're going to place it in a community, you should have, you should have public participation. You need to have co uh, community benefit agreements in those standards. You have to look at this through the lens of racial equity. And, you know, let me just turn it around a second. Where was NIMBY when they put fossil fuel plants in cities? You know, where was the outrage for that? So, you know, um, and I think you're right. If we can show the benefits, not just economically, but you know, uh, uh, community-wise, I use the word, um, I think that that's really important to show. And again, I'll just say it one last time, community benefit agreements help everybody. And it teaches these developers that, that it, well, teaches, it makes them stay in line to make sure that they are doing the right thing. Because you know, we live in a capitalist system and, and money, money talks and everybody walks. So we should be really careful about how we set this thing up. Haley, do you want to weigh in on, on responding to folks who resist? Yeah. I think a classic strategy from polluters that we've seen time and time again, whether that's certain out-of-state waste management companies or, you know, the folks behind the Merrimack generator station, is to try to divide folks in town and to pit people who might be originally more excited about climate solutions against folks who you know, might not have had the time or the energy or the resources to dive into that world. And so when, when I'm thinking about that, I'm like, who's actually building up the resistance? And I want to have conversations with folks who might not be as excited or who might be super pro landfill or super pro coal plant. Like, what's your story? Well, why, why are you resisting? Let's, let's talk about it. And I particularly don't want to come in as this you know, this young white upstart and be like, I know everything and I'm going to tell you what my solution is um, that you're going to love and why don't you love it? Um, so like having that conversation and teasing that out and then once again, like actual involvement and engagement and leadership from most impacted folks in, in these new solutions is so important. And that's, that's something we see in places like Bo, where, you know, the coal plant in Bo is an employer. And I can't go up to somebody who has worked at this coal plant for 40 years and say, why don't you want this coal plant to shut down? That's like a complete denial of, of someone's life and livelihood. And so I have to, I, I want to be saying to folks, and we want to be saying to folks, what would you like to see? Where would you like to work? Do you want skills training? 
do you want a really sweet re retirement package? You know, how can we how can we make this work for you? So just a reminder to our audience that you can submit questions for our panelists um, through the online forum at nhpr.org slash climate. We'd love to hear from you. And thanks so much for responding to that question from Dan. Um, I want to move on to sort of how people can get involved, because I know you know, lots of folks think about how they can participate in climate action. Um, Doria, I'll ask you this first. What would you advise someone who's thinking about starting a climate change related project, whether it's a faith based group, getting involved in town government, you know, starting a presence on social media? How can they incorporate thinking about, you know, possible co benefits for a wide range of people or, or incorporating, you know, social benefits into their into their thinking about their climate solution? So the simple answer is talk to people. Um, um, one thing that really got me into this local climate action space is by joining my local environment and energy committee. I was originally a sustainability specialist for a manufacturing company and they asked me to sit on our um, Nashua environment energy committee as a, um, a representative from that company. But from being on that committee, I learned a ton from the people there, as well as the people who came in and did presentations for us. And from there, I was able to come up with different ideas. Um, one thing that happened, I think in 2017, was uh, Volkswagen had their big oopsie. Um, and then a lot of money came in to bring opportunities like electric vehicle charging to communities. And we have been trying to access that money ever since. But um, so this was, you want to just briefly explain to the okay. audience what, what happened with Volkswagen? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> um, I'll try. Um, so Volkswagen was selling diesel vehicles. Um, they were not correct on the amount of emissions that came from those vehicles. They were charged a very, very big fee because they were incorrect about that information. I think that's the very simple answer. And that money was then distributed to states to be able to do things like switch from less efficient vehicles to more efficient vehicles, as well as um, some took the opportunity to pave more roads, and a portion of it was supposed to be um, given to electric vehicle charging, um, specifically on highway corridors in New Hampshire, and Nashua sits on a highway corridor. So um, I learned- Where I would start, just at the, at the local level, you push the electeds to do the right thing and bring your friends out and scream if you have to, kiss if you have to, do whatever you need to do to make things happen. Because you can make it happen. I've seen it. I've been a part of it, fortunately. Hissing is one of my favorite organizing tactics. <laughs> Mine too, by the way. <laughs> I would say as a young person, um, as a gender, so sorry, um, who's grown up with a lot of climate fear and grief. I got three big things that I continue to learn and have not fully learned uh, for getting involved. The first is doing your research. Don't reinvent the wheel. If there's already somebody working on this, this issue, see how you can get involved, see how you can be of support and, and be in solidarity with folks who are already working on it. Um, and I never want to operate from a mindset of scarcity but realistically, people only have so much time and energy, energy to make change. Um, the second thing I would say is be as strategic as you can, um, which means you might have to map out you know, who has power, whether or not you like that they have power, they might have it in some way, and figure out what are the pathways that you can use to get what you want. Because it's amazing if you have a big rally and you totally, like, just send it and then you feel really elated and burned out but if it wasn't directed at a decision maker and you didn't have a clear ask you just had a party which is also great and then i guess the third thing is also like know yourself and and know what you're good at and know where you want to grow if you have a ton of money give it to people who ask for it you know if you have a ton of time volunteer that i'm a very good writer i like to write for things hate speaking in public, so I try to never do that. You know, it's like, it's about <laughs> analyzing like where you can be really helpful. And it's okay to like push yourself and make yourself uncomfortable too, but you don't always have to hold the megaphone and be at the, be at the front, said the person who's literally doing that. Well, thanks for speaking in public with us today. <laughs> I know, I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, speaking 
of people in power sort of locating where, where power is held. Tom in the audience is bringing up politics. He writes, the greatest impediment to progress, progress on climate in New Hampshire is political and as a result, statutory. Does your advocacy recognize this fundamental hurdle and incorporate the need to use voting in elections to support action on climate as essential? Um, maybe Haley, because you were just talking about power, I'll, I'll give that to you and then other folks can respond. Yeah. First of all, huge shout out to all the organizations doing C4 work during that electoral work. Hugely important. We are C3, so we don't, we don't get to touch that. Um, but we do, I think one thing that we've seen, particularly on, on waste and PFAS policy, is this like theme of unlikely bedfellows. Like sometimes with this landfill siting regulation that I'm working on with a group, sometimes it means you're getting your environmentalists and your public health folks uh, working together with people who are really passionate about hunting and fishing and who might not normally vote the same way on the same things, but are working together in a really powerful way that can, I don't want to say trick the legislature, but get some bipartisan work going that might not otherwise be happening. So I think that's one way to do it. And it's, it's deeply unsexy sometimes to have to say who you're working with and it doesn't feel like you're aligning with all your values and that can suck. But if you can win, and you can push them, and you change their minds a little bit, it might have been worth it. Doria, I want to ask you next, sort of, what's the role of politics in your thoughts about climate advocacy and change in New Hampshire? Um, and this this question of like unlikely bedfellows, like, have you seen coalition building that you weren't expecting in your role in Nashua? So first, I want to give a shout out to the Nashua Board of Aldermen. Um, there are politicians. Um, and as an employee for the city of Nashua, I've never brought a project to them where they didn't at least listen and try to learn as much about it. Um, and they have just been incredibly supportive of energy projects and starting a sustainability department for the city of Nashua. So I, I really want to give them that recognition as politicians who are listening and really are trying to do what's best for the community. Um, with that being said, I'd say that um, in Nashua, I find that when our aldermen are listening and learning, so is the community because they have their, um, I, I think, I, I don't know what their official name is, but I'm going to call them fireside chats where they get their districts together and they talk about what's going on in Nashua and what they're excited about. And if they didn't go to all of their constituents and tell them about community power, tell them about sustainability and energy, we wouldn't be where we are with our energy policy and our programming. So I think that having leaders who are willing to listen, learn, and then repeat some really great solutions is invaluable. Mm -hmm. Aziz, how do you see you know, this relationship to politics and, and coalition building play out in your work? Did you use the word trick? I think you did. No. No? <laughs> yeah, you did. So I, I, I would like to use that word a little bit more often, but I'm ashamed to. So uh, I'll use it as tip. I think sometimes you can tip the balance a little bit instead of tricking the balance. And that means build, uh, consensus building. And that means, in our case, sometimes working with Eversource. Um, to, yeah, I know, I'm really sorry. Uh, uh, can we take that out of this? Uh, <laughs> but, but, but seriously, sometimes you actually have to do that because there are some common grounds, very small, but there are common grounds that actually work. And so, um, but having said that, I think it's really important not to give up your morals either. Right? I mean, that we're, we're a nonprofit organization and I'm running the damn thing. So I have to be careful not to take money from people who are just going to, you know, turn around next year and screw me on this, right? Let's just be honest about that too, right? So um, it's a very bad, it's a, it's a, it's a fine line to, to, to do. We may trick people, we may tip people, but I think the word that I, the operative word is consensus building. You really have to find places where you agree. And um, I promise not to use this, well, maybe I'll do it one more time, I, I, but Lyndon Johnson signed, had a bill signed, and the Republicans on one side and Democrats on the other, and he said, well, this must be a good bill because neither of you like it. So that's consensus building, right? So you, you, know, you find areas in some way that people can say, all right, I'll sign the damn bill. And that, that, that may be the way to work, but you have to be careful about your morals. 
At least we, I did. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we have another question from, from the audience. Laura Lee from the audience says, navigating the climate crisis can feel like a lot of gloom and doom. What sort of positive messaging have you used to foster an environmentally friendly identity in your community? And I'd add to that, like, how do you stay positive when you're doing this work? I, I, I'm tired of the gloom and doom stuff. I really am. Yeah, we're, we're in trouble. It's a crisis. We're in real trouble. But I work with a lot of young people. You see a lot of young people. You folks, you're here because I think you believe that there are ways out of this. So the gloom and doom, I'm a community organizer. I can't think that way. I'm an optimist. I have to, if I go out and community organize and say, oh my god, the planet's going to burn up in three weeks, and it might, uh, the, 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 that's not going to help anybody. So you have to find solutions. So the gloom and doom, with all due respect to the, to the questionnaire, I won't buy into it. I refuse to buy into it. Yeah, we're in real big trouble. But maybe that's the, that's, the, that's the good part. Maybe that's the positive part, that people recognize we need to fix this, and there are ways to fix it. How about you, Doria, you know, in your work? How do you, how do you get your community to feel that positivity, and how do you stay you know, out of the, the despair that I think can sometimes creep into this kind of work? One thing that has helped me is having my platform on social media. I'm able to make content that is engaging and talking about climate solutions and kind of stamping out some of that doom and gloom. But I've also have been able to meet a lot of other community organizers and creators and we're able to have conversations. I, I'm in a TikTok house. Do you know that? I don't live with a bunch of teenagers, but I, 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 um, I am a part of a virtual TikTok house called EcoTalk. And we're a bunch of creators that um, we share a page and we post on the same page and uh, we also have a group chat where we're talking about what we're doing in our community and bouncing off different ideas. And one really positive anti-doom and gloom thing that has come from that is through my friend, um, his handle is Trash Colin, but his name is Colin Donaldson and what he does is he picks up trash on beaches every day. <laughs> But through TikTok and um, through meeting other creators, he was able to organize an entire community program where he put toy boxes on beaches. So when people go to Florida, that's where he lives. Um, they bring toys with them and then they leave them on the beach because they're gonna go home. Um, but now they have a place to put those toys so other people can use them. And he's putting them all over the beaches in Florida. And that's something that he wouldn't have known how to do if he didn't have EcoTalk and our creator group to show him different ideas on how to implement that. So I think that using social media to organize on that like TikTok and Instagram side to kind of get that national reach really can bring positivity and ideas and it's kind of my escape from doom and gloom. Yeah, like that connection with other people. Yeah. And there's a theory out there, that it's a book, and, and I can't remember the woman who wrote this and who, who promotes the theory, but the theory of pleasure activism, right? I think that's Adrienne Marie Brown. It, it, thank you, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and <laughs> I, I, I'm a proponent of that. I, I, if, I can't go out there and not be happy about what I do. And, you know, so you bring in, you bring in culture, you bring in equity, you bring in people of diverse communities to make it fun. It's pleasure activism, that's the way it has to be, I think. That really resonates with me. So I was working on my taxes last week. I'm sure a lot of There's you no all pleasure were. Activism there. No, but there is, yeah. there is. I despise doing my taxes, but in starting to work on them and getting my documents together and then finally being finished with them, I feel so much better. <laughs> Like it's like a thousand pounds have been lifted off my shoulder. So I guess solving the climate crisis is kind of just doing our taxes. <laughs> <laughs> if only it was that it easy. First. <laughs> so, so Haley, I want to hear from you. You know, do you struggle to keep positive and to to bring that positivity into the communities that you're working together with? Yeah, it's a it's definitely an ongoing struggle. I think when the doom and gloom hits hardest is when either I or other people feel really isolated and feel really alone. And so this is nothing new, but building that connection, which you can do through organizing or through, you know, household cooking nights or through, through calling up folks or, or, or through, you know, educating yourself. Um, I think building that connection 
is really helpful and it makes people feel a little a little less alone and then I also think like through organizing there's definitely this this stereotype of like you must work yourself to the bone like you must do 80 hours a week and you know the reason that my my colleagues and I founded this organization is because we're like no we want this we want community organizing and movement work to be hate to say it sustainable uh, something you can do for all of your life in the ways that you would like to do it and and that means that we're going to enjoy meals together and that we're going to take time to rest and that we're going to give each other really honest hard-hitting feedback and we're also going to lift each other up and appreciate each other uh, when we do something that's really cool so i think hold, holding those values too of rest and of joy and of you don't always have to be working yourself so hard i think that's really important to keep in mind yeah so it sounds like it's not only about the work you're doing but how you're doing the work you're doing. Yeah. um so for all the panelists I'm, I'm wondering if there's changes that you've made in your own life for the climate that have made other things in your life better like a, a, a solution that you've applied to your own life that then has had another benefit or you look like oh you are excited mean, about the sun. You, you're gonna get me going but my my hobby is growing my own food inside i have a bunch of hydroponic gardens and in doing that i have stopped buying as much food from the other side of the country um decreasing my carbon footprint and also I have really good food to eat at home, and it just makes me really happy. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. What are you growing? Um, right now, uh, oh, are you sure you want to? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> right now, I have strawberries, Swiss char, bok choy, um, two types of lettuce, um, tomatoes, arugula, mustard greens, wow. all wanna... growing inside <laughs> Get water. <laughs> Nice dinner. <laughs> oh, and, and an added bonus, I've got solar panels, so wow. technically it's all still powered by the sun. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. Aziz and Haley, have, have you had other things happen in your life, you know, for the climate that also I have nothing. <laughs> feel good in other ways? I don't know what to say. Got your hybrid car. Yeah, that's true. That's pretty cool. That's true. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I was an early, uh, I was an early person in p uh, building. I built a passive solar house many uh, decades ago, um, actually in the 70s, and um, so I, I learned from that experience. And I'll just tell you a quick story. When we couldn't find anybody to build a house because it was so different, and uh, so <laughs> I lived in New Jersey at the time, and we found a an older man carpenter. And he had a small business, about four or five people working. And um, he fought with the architect all the time. And his argument was to the architect, everything lies flat on paper, and it's not working here. We can't build it this way. So they, you know, I, I was young, and I tried to get in between them, and so that's a longer story. But the, the best part of the story is this. So the house was built. They enclosed the house and started doing the interior work of the house. And the, the, the man, his name was Keith Andrews, I believe. And he used to smoke Lucky Strikes like he was smoking blunts. I mean, he used to smoke them down to here. And his fingers were nicotine stained. He was a very cool guy, though. Because, and, and, and so he says to me, well, he couldn't pronounce my name. He couldn't pronounce his E's. So he said, he used to call me Z's. And he said, Z's? He said, look at my people here. It was January. He said, look at all my guys. And I'm looking around. And he says, how are they dressed? He said, they're all wearing T-shirts. What's the temperature outside? It's like three degrees below zero. He's, and he looks at him and he goes, your house works. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I learned. <laughs> awesome. Haley, I, I'm curious also for you, you know, what, what changes have you made that have other impacts? Yeah, I think um, at, at an individual level, which we know is not, you know, the, the systemic solutions that we're looking for, I've been a vegetarian since I was 11, um, and other impacts wise, it means I save money. Uh, I make some really good lentils, although I don't know if my partner would agree. Um, and it, it means that I, I get to use, you know, more local produce. A lot of folks have like hanging gardens or, or pot gardens uh, around around Burlington. Um, and then something else, I will not get on my soapbox about this, but I feel like zero waste has been co-opted by the like wealthy white mommy bloggers of this world who are like, ooh, a mason jar, I'm gonna put my chickpeas in it or whatever. It's like, no, 
so many people in so many countries from so many cultures have been living the zero waste lifestyle for centuries and centuries and centuries. And so when I say, you know, I'm trying to do like more book exchanges and puzzle exchanges and clothes exchanges, I don't mean to go into the realm of mommy bloggers, but there's real value there in working with your community, with your friends, uh, with your families uh, to do that, that sort of reuse and exchange. And it's very little, but I got these pants from this exchange, so. <laughs> and they're great pants. I, um, I wanted to add one thing. I'm yeah, sorry to ahead. interrupt you, but that's also a gateway to community organizing, bringing people to clothing swabs. That's right. You have a community power table. You have your local climate action table or something like that there. So I think that that's just great. Yeah. It's an opportunity. Mommy, mommy bloggers are cool, too. <laughs> Get a few of them upset about uh, um, something that's going on in the community, and they're great organizers. I do have that's to say. True. That's yeah. true. They'll go There's hard on PFAS. There. They'll go hard Absolutely. on PFAS. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So as we wrap this up, which unfortunately we need to do pretty soon, um, I, I want to just end with a final question to, to all of you, which is, you know, as we think about not losing sight of the opportunities presented by the climate crisis, what do you hope the audience takes away from this panel tonight? What do you, what's the big takeaway that you, you know, want everyone to carry with them? Dory, you, you want to go first? <laughs> Me first, okay. Um, one thing that I'd love everybody to take away from this is that the solution is here, and if you look in the mirror, it's you. So what you do as an individual could start an entire movement. You can organize your community. Two plus two plus two plus two. You can expand something very quickly if you organize and communicate. So I think that that's what I really want people to leave here with. Um, rise up, all of you rise up. Rise up, look at everything through the lens of equity. Look through what can be done, not what can't be done, because nothing can't be done. Is that too many double negatives in that? <laughs> everything can be done, how's that? Because, and that's what I would like you to leave with. Rise up, stand, get up, stand up, and, and fight, because that's the way it works, and that's the way, uh, it's the only way I know how to do it. And sometimes fighting doesn't mean, you know, yelling, though it does. And sometimes it doesn't, it means not being angry, though it does. And so, you know, there's a, there's a certain balance that you all need to, well, I won't put it on you. There's a balance that I need on my own self to make sure, like you were saying, that you don't burn yourself out and that you just continue to push. But damn it, rise up. It's enough. Stop listening. To, don't let them steal your narrative. That's what I want to tell you also. Don't let them steal your narrative. The, 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 the proponents of renewables love to take your language, our language, and twist it. Don't let them do it. Don't let them do it. Make sure that your language is, your, your words are heard loud and clear. Rise up. There are a lot of really brilliant folks who have been hit really hard by climate change, and you should probably listen to them first because uh, they'll have some great ideas, slash have already been working on this for anywhere between one and 200 years or more. Um, and so when you do that rising up, be careful that you're not obscuring voices of folks who are most impacted um, and be sure to be in solidarity with them in the ways that people are asking you for and not necessarily the ways that you've decided are, are best for someone else. Well, with all of those amazing responses, that's all the time that we have for tonight. Um, I know there's so much more to talk about. I have so, I have so many more questions for all of you, and I'm sure our audience also does. Um, but let's keep this conversation going. You know, I just want to encourage everyone to keep the conversation going with each other, with your family, with your coworkers. Um, Make sure to also look at it from an email, uh, for an email from MHPR that'll include the responses that we received tonight through the forum so you can see some more questions and comments from the audience. Um, and if you haven't had a chance yet, there's still time to tell us what climate solutions you're thinking about, how you feel when you think about climate solutions, and, and ask some questions of the panelists. I want to thank our panelists so much for sharing their time and their expertise with us. Um, I want to thank our audience for some really wonderful questions. Quick reminder, um, next week is Earth Week. Tune in to NHPR and our partner stations in the New England News Collaborative to hear some stories about all kinds of people doing good work to combat the climate crisis. You'll hear Doria on the radio soon. Um, those features uh, can be heard on Morning Edition and All Things Considered all week, and of course you can find them on NHPR.org. 
Um, so yeah, thank you all again so much for coming. Thank you to UNH for hosting us tonight. Um, thanks to NHPR and NHPBS and the teams that made this all possible. And thank you so much to our panelists. So Give them a round of applause. Public radio. <laughs> That's it. Feel free to mingle.